This week in environmental science, we'll be taking a look at Chapter 8, Biodiversity and Conservation Biology. This lecture will help us understand the scope of Earth's biodiversity, the benefits of biodiversity, the extinction crisis, causes of biodiversity loss, conservation biology and conservation of species, and also conservation above the species level. Our central case study of the chapter, Will We Slice Through the Serengeti? Serengeti National Park is located in East Africa and is one of the largest places on the planet where an ecosystem still remains intact and functional. There, 1.2 million wildebeest migrate across it each year. This is part of an epic migration that's occurred for millennia and many, many people in ecotourism come to see this. And it's not just wildebeest that are migrating, it's many other grazers as well, including zebras and hundreds of thousands of antelope. The herds can stretch as far as the eye can see. Packs of lions track the procession and pick off the weak and unwary, while hungry crocodiles wait in ambush at river crossings. Again, this epic migration with its dramatic interplay of predators and prey has cycled on for a very, very long time. The people native to this region, the Maasai, are nomadic herders that have long raised cattle on the grasslands and savannas. And because those people subsist on their cattle and have lived at low population densities, wildlife has thrived here even long after it's declined in other parts of Africa. When East Africa was under colonial rule, the British created a lot of game reserves to conserve wildlife for their own hunting. After Tanzania, Kenya, and other African nations gained independence in the mid 20th century, the British reserves became the basis for today's national protected areas. Serengeti National Park was established in 1951 and the Maasai Mara National Reserve was later created just across the border in Kenya. Again, these two protected areas, together with several adjacent ones, encompass the Serengeti ecosystem. It's about 30,000 square kilometers across, and it's one of the last places on the planet where an ecosystem remains nearly intact and functional over a huge area. Today, two million people visit Tanzania and Kenya each year. Most of them are ecotourists who visit the parks and protected areas. Serengeti National Park alone receives 800,000 annual visitors and tourism injects close to $3 billion into these nations' economies and creates jobs for tens of thousands of local people. Because the region's people see that the functional ecosystems full of wildlife bring foreign dollars into their community, many support the parks. Indeed, East Africa has been at the forefront of community-based conservation in which local people act as stewards managing their natural resources in collaboration with international conservationists. However, most people living in northern Tanzania remain desperately poor. Farmers and townspeople on the shores of Lake Victoria feel isolated by a poor road system and walled off by Serengeti National Park to their east, which doesn't allow commercial truck traffic. These people have little access to outside markets to buy and sell goods. Because of this, Tanzania's president promised these people a highway would be built across the Serengeti. Scientists and conservationists are alarmed by this proposal as it slices straight across the animal's migratory route. With these roads, scientists predict that not only blocking migration, that vehicles would kill countless, countless animals in collisions. A highway would also provide access for poaching the illegal killing of wildlife for meat and body parts, 
Likewise, it would allow an entry corridor for exotic plant species that could invade the ecosystem. A highway would encourage human settlement right up to the park boundary, making the park an island of habitat hemmed in by agriculture, housing, and commerce. Moreover, development might encourage the towns on Lake Victoria to grow into large cities, creating demand for larger transportation corridors in the future. For all these reasons and more, experts predicted that the highway could destroy the migration spectacle. Such an outcome could devastate tourism, so the region's tourism operators and many others opposed the highway, and so did most Kenyans, who feared that the highway would prevent migratory animals from reaching Kenya's Masai Mara Reserve. As of 2014, the Tanzanian government continued to push for a highway directly across the Serengeti and had ordered the route paved right up to the park's borders, leaving unpaved only the 34-mile portion that runs through the park. Today in Tanzania, poaching is rising and animal populations are falling. And again, the Serengeti is one of our planet's last intact large ecosystems. So impacts here have global ramifications. We would all be impoverished if the Serengeti's biodiversity was lost. So we must hope that Africans can find ways to improve their standards of living while conserving their wildlife and natural systems. East Africa has helped to pioneer win-win solutions in conservation thus far, so perhaps it will show the way yet again. Biodiversity encompasses multiple levels. Biodiversity is the vi variety of life at all levels of organization, including at the species level, at genetic diversity level, and at the ecosystem level. Species diversity is the number or variety of species in a particular region. Richness or species richness is the number of species. Species evenness or relative abundance is the extent to which species differ in numbers of individuals. A species is a set of individuals that share certain characteristics and can interbreed with each other producing viable fertile offspring. Speciation generates new species and extinction reduces species richness. Biodiversity exists below the species level in the form of what's called a subspecies. Those are populations of species that occur in different geographic areas and differ from one another in slight ways. Subspecies arise by the same processes that drive speciation, but re result when divergence stops short of forming a separate species altogether. An example would be the black rhinoceroses that how they've diversified into eight subspecies and are each inhabited in a different part of Africa. The eastern black rhino, which is native to Kenya and Tanzania, differs in its attributes from the other subspecies. Genetic diversity encompasses differences in individuals with their DNA. It provides the raw material for adaptations to local conditions. Populations with higher genetic diversity are much better able to survive and can cope with environmental change. Populations with low genetic diversity are more vulnerable to environmental changes or disease. When everybody's genes are so similar, it's much more easy for a pathogen or something to come in and decimate the population. Organisms and species with low genetic, di genetic diversity can enter what's called inbreeding depression. This is generally in low populations where genetically similar parents mate and produce inferior offspring. Some examples are American bison, elephant seals, and the cheetahs of Africa. Ecosystem diversity is the number and variety of ecosystems. Some biologists also refer to community or habitat diversity. 
scientists may also consider the geographic arrangement of habitats, communities, or ecosystems at the landscape level, including the sizes and shapes of patches and the connections among them. Under any of these concepts, a seashore of beaches, forested cliffs, offshore coral reefs, and ocean waters would hold more biodiversity than the same acreage of monocultural cornfields. The Serengeti's open plains are vast, but the region holds a diversity of habitats, including savanna, grassland, hilly woodlands, seasonal wetlands, and rock outcroppings. This habitat diversity contributes to the rich diversity of species in the region. Biodiversity is unevenly distributed. Some groups have more species than others, especially insects. In fact, beetles outnumber all non-insect animals and plants. Living things are not distributed evenly on Earth, but species diversity seems to be higher near the equator. This is probably because of the greater amounts of solar energy and heat and humidity that are in these regions that spur more plant growth, making these tropical regions more productive than temperate regions. So they're able to support larger numbers of organisms. There's always a steady amount of sunlight year round and relatively stable climates. It allows more species to coexist in these areas. Human disturbance also often creates patchwork combinations of habitats. This increases habitat diversity locally, so in moderately disturbed areas, species diversity can actually rise. However, at larger scales, human disturbance decreases diversity because it replaces regionally unique habitats. This causes many specialist species to disappear while a relatively few of the generalist species thrive. Moreover, species that rely on large expanses of habitat disappear when those habitats are fragmented by human disturbance. When talking about biodiversity, you might ask, well, how many species of organisms actually exist on Earth? In fact, many species still await discovery. Out of the estimated 3 to 100 million species on Earth, 1.8 million species have actually been described. The most widely accepted estimate of the number of species on Earth is about 14 million. Our knowledge of species numbers is incomplete because, well, there's small organisms that are easily under overlooked. Many organisms can be difficult to identify, and there's some areas of Earth that remain unexplored, such as in the depths of oceans or in heavily uh, vegetated areas like jungles of Indonesia and Madagascar. Biodiversity benefits our lives. It enhances food security. Industrial agriculture, unfortunately, has narrowed our diet. Throughout our history, human beings have used at least 7,000 plant species and several thousand animal species for food. But today, Globally, we now get 90% of our food from just 15 crop species and 8 livestock species. And this lack of diversity leaves us vulnerable to crop failures. In a world where nearly 1 billion people go hungry, we can improve food security. Remember, that's the guarantee of an adequate, safe, nutritious, and reliable food supply by finding sustainable ways to harvest or farm wild species and rare crop varieties. These wild strains can provide disease resistance. There's a new potential food crops that are just waiting to be used. For, in, for instance, the serendipity berry is 3,000 times sweeter than sugar. Potential new food sources from just one region of the world in Central and South America are listed below. They include the amaranth, the beriti palm, the maca, the capybara, the vicuna, 
and the Chachalacas. I hope I pronounced that right. Many drugs come from wild plants. Some of these drugs can be used to treat cancer and stomach disorders and motion sickness. Sometimes we nickname it nature's pharmacy. Wild species produce up to $150 billion per year of drugs that save thousands of lives. They include a familiar species here, the pineapple. The drug is called bromelain. It controls tissue inflammation. The autumn crocus has a drug called colchicine, which is an anti-cancer agent. The yellow cinchana has a drug called quinine, which is, which is an anti-malarial agent. The Pacific U has a drug called Taxol, which is an anti-cancer agent, especially in ovarian cancer. The Velvet Bean has a drug called L-Dopa, which is effective in Parkinson's disease. And the Common Fox Glove, which has a dis digitoxin, which is a cardiac stimulant. Contrary to popular opinion, some things in life can indeed be free as long as we protect the ecological systems that provide them. Forests provide clean air and water, and they buffer hydrologic systems against flooding and drought. Native crop varieties provide insurance against disease and drought. Wildlife can attract tourism and boost economies. Intact ecosystems provide these and other valuable processes known as ecosystem services for all of us free of charge. According to scientists, biodiversity provides food, fuel, fiber, and shelter. It purifies air and water, detoxifies, and decomposes wastes. It stabilizes climate, moderates floods, droughts, and temperature. It cycles nutrients and renews soil fertility. It pollinates plants, controls pests and diseases. It maintains genetic resources. It provides cultural and aesthetic benefits and allows us to adapt to change. In these ways, organisms and ecosystems support vital processes that people cannot replicate or would need to pay for if nature didn't provide them. The economic value of just 17 of these ecosystem services has been estimated at over $143 trillion per year. Biodiversity helps maintain ecosystem function. Ecological research demonstrates that biodiversity tends to enhance the stability of communities and ecosystems. Research has found that biodiversity tends to increase the resilience of ecological systems, their ability to withstand disturbance and recover from stress or adapt to change. Thus, the loss of biodiversity can diminish a natural system's ability to function and to provide services to our society. It's often hard to predict what the effects would be if there was a loss of biodiversity. Research shows that even removing a keystone species will significantly alter an ecological system because, because other species disappear in response to the loss of the keystone species. Loss of ecosystem engineers like ants and earthworms can also set major changes in motion. Scientists have already documented how African savannas can morph into scrub forests when poaching removes elephants. Ecosystems are complex and it's difficult to to predict which species might be the most influential. Thus, most people prefer to apply the precautionary principle. As Aldo Leopold says, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Biodiversity boosts economies through tourism and recreation. Ecotourism is a vital source of income for many nations, such as the rainforests of Costa Rica, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, the reefs, caves, and rainforests of Belize, the national parks in the U.S., 
and the savannah wildlife in Kenya and Tanzania. It's a powerful incentive to preserve natural areas and reduce impacts on wildlife and landscapes, but too many visitors can damage natural assets. Not all of biodiversity's benefits to people can be expressed with numbers and economics and practicalities of food and medicine. Some scientists and philosophers argue that people find a deeper value in biodiversity. Harvard University biologists have popularized the notion of what's called biophilia. It's an asserting that human beings share an instinctive love for nature and feel an emotional bond with other living things. Evidence of this is in our affinity for parks and wildlife, our love for pets, how we pay more money for views of natural landscapes, in our interests in hiking, bird watching, fishing, hunting, backpacking, and in similar outdoor pursuits. In a 2005 book, writer Richard Love added that as today's children are increasingly deprived of outdoor experiences and direct contact with wild organisms, they suffer what he calls a nature deficit disorder. He argues that this alienation from biodiversity and nature damages childhood development and may lie behind many of the emotional and psychological challenges young people in developed nations face today. One might ask, do we have ethical obligations toward other species? Many people feel that other organisms have an inherent right to exist. If species aren't worthy of saving, then what are we all about? What is worth saving? Others ask. As more people take up biocentric or ecocentric worldviews, more have come to feel that other organisms have an intrinsic, intrinsic value. Biodiversity conservation is justified on ethical grounds. Despite the growing knowledge and appreciation for biodiversity, our future is far from secure. Biological diversity is being rapidly lost to human impact, and the losses are irretrievable when species go extinct. Extinction occurs when the last member of a species dies and the species ceases to exist. Another phenomenon happening is extirpation, which is local extinction. For instance, the black rhinoceros has been extirpated from most of its historic range across Africa. But as a species, it's not yet extinct. However, at least three of its subspecies are extinct. For example, no individuals of the western black rhino have been seen since 2006, and this subspecies is now thought to be extinct. Extirpation is an erosive process that can, over time, lead to extinction. Human impact is responsible for most extirpation and extinction today, but these processes should occur naturally and at a, a much slower rate. If species didn't naturally go extinct, we'd have uh, earth full of dinosaurs and trilobites and other organisms from the past that we found in our fossil record. Paleontologists estimate that roughly 99% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. Thus, the wealth of species gracing our planet today represents just 1% of the species that ever existed. Most extinctions preceding the appearance of human beings occurred singularly for independent re reasons at a pace referred to a, as what's called the background extinction rate. This is the rate of, of normal extinctions that would be occurring more naturally on Earth. By studying traces of organisms preserved in the fossil record, scientists infer that for mammals and marine animals each year, on average, one species out of every one to 10 million has vanished. In the past, Earth has had five major mass extinctions. Each event has eliminated at least 50% of all species alive on Earth at the time. Scientists suspect that there's a sixth 
mass extinction happening right now that humans are causing, that we will suffer as a result of eradicating 50% of all species. In this chart below is a list of previous mass extinction events, when they occurred and what types of life were most affected. Humans have driven hundreds of species to extinction in the past few centuries, including the Carolina parakeet, the great auk, the Labrador duck, the passenger pigeon, Bachman's warbler, the Eskimo curlew, and possibly the ivory-billed woodpecker. Species that teeter on the brink of extinction include the whooping crane, Kirtland's warbler, and the California condor. The current extinction rate is 100 to 1,000 times greater than the background rate. This is due to human population growth and our resource consumption. The red list by the Union for Conservation of Nature has species facing high risks of extinction. The 2014 red list reported mammal species 22%, bird species 13%, Amphibian species 31% and fish species are at 20%. In the last 500 years, 236 animals and 30 plant species have gone extinct in just the United States alone. The actual numbers are probably undoubtedly higher. A frequently asked question is if a mass extinction is happening, why don't we notice species disappearing around us? There's two reasons that most of us don't personally sense the scale of biodiversity loss. First, if you live in a city or a suburb, the plants and animals you see day to day are generalist species that thrive in disturbed areas. In contrast, the species most in trouble are those that rely on less disturbed habitat. Secondly, a human lifetime is very short. The loss of populations and species may seem slow to us, but on Earth's time scale, it's sudden. Because each of us is born into a world that already has lost many species, we don't recognize what's already vanished. Likewise, our grandchildren won't appreciate what we lose in our lifetime. Each human generation experiences just a portion of the overall phenomenon, so we have difficulty sensing the big picture. Nonetheless, researchers and naturalists who spend their time outdoors observing nature see biodiversity loss around them all the time, and that's precisely why they feel so passionate about preventing it. Biodiversity loss involves population declines. As populations shrink, the species loses genetic diversity, and its geographic range gets smaller. The Living Planet Index summarizes population trends. Between 1970 and 2008, the index fell by 28%, and most losses were in the tropics. This chart below helps us visualize that a little bit better. Several major key causes of biodiversity loss stand out. Habitat loss is the greatest cause of biodiversity loss. Humans alter, degrade, and destroy habitats. Farming simplifies communities, like remember the word monoculture? Grazing modifies grassland structure and composition. Clearing forests removes resources that organisms need, and dams turn rivers into reservoirs. Urban sprawl replaces natural ecosystems. Habitat fragmentation is another cause. It's a gradual piecemeal degradation and loss of habitat and includes causes of farming, logging, and roads, etc. Continuous habitats are broken into patches and species needing continuous habitat disappear. The corridors that link fragmented habitats allowing animals to travel, travel from one to another are shut down. And now back to our science behind the story. Tanzania and Kenya have some of the world's most famous parks and protected areas with the greatest variety and density of large mammals to be found anywhere. 
The parks are sizable, well-managed, and well-funded, yet even these places of refuge are not immune to pressures from rising human population, development, and resource extraction. For several decades, biologists and park managers have census wildlife in and around the parks and reserve, reserves. They found that most animals are declining in number inside and outside of the parks and the reserves. Both wet and dry season census data have showed the same results. Why are animals declining? Since these parks are well managed, well preserved, some reasons are that uh, settlements increase as nomadic Maasai herders become sedentary and as people from elsewhere arrive. As farmers uh, convert grasslands to crops, especially wheat, this destroys habitat for the antelope wildebeest and the predators that follow them. The livestock compete with the wild grazing animals for food on the grasslands and local residents kill animals for food or for their own subsistence while criminal gangs poach animals and export bush meat like also elephant tusks and rhino horns to rich consumers abroad. Researchers have given particular attention to the Maasai Mara National Reserve on the Kenyan side of the border adjacent to Serengeti National Park. A decade ago, Dutch scientist Wilbur Otichillo analyzed aerial survey data and concluded that non-migratory mammals declined by 58% from 1977 to 1997 within the reserve and by a similar amount outside the reserve. Resident wildebeest fared even worse, showing an 81% decline. Here we have data for the Thompson gazelles which are the most abundant species in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. They decrease by 59% inside and 77% outside. Researchers concluded that setting aside parks is not enough, it's not adequate to conserve wildlife and ecosystems. Conservation success requires linking reserves with corridors of habitats that animals can use and working with local people living near protected areas. Community-based conservation encourages people to be stewards, to manage natural resources in the areas in which they live. Several major causes of biodiversity loss stand out. Pollution harms organisms in many ways, such as air pollution degrades forest ecosystems. Noise and light interfere with behavior and habitat use of animals. Water pollution impairs fish and amphibians. Agricultural runoff, such as fertilizers, pesticides, and sediments harm terrestrial and aquatic species. And toxins, garbage, oil, and chemicals impact organisms. Damage to wildlife and ecosystems caused by pollution can be sub substantial, but it's less damaging than habitat loss. There's more causes of biodiversity loss that stand out. Over-harvesting species that are long-lived and slow to reproduce has had a great impact. For instance, African elephants are taken for their tusks of ivory. African rhinoceroses are taken for their horns. Asian tigers are taken for their body parts. And African gorillas and primates are taken as bush meat. Whales and sharks are taken to use their fins for soup. Governments pass laws and sign treaties and strengthen anti-poaching efforts. But we have a long way to go. When demand from rich consumers raises market prices for wildlife products and with so many people living in poverty, many individuals will still be tempted to break laws to make money and officials may choose to look the other way. In much of Africa today, protecting wildlife can be a dangerous job. Poaching is conducted with brutal efficiency by organized crime syndicates using helicopters, night vision goggles, and automatic weapons. Park rangers are heavily armed, yet are routine, routinely outgunned in firefights with poachers. 
and many have lost their lives. In this way, the demand for luxury goods by wealthy foreign consumers half a world away has grave consequences for Africans living in regions like the Serengeti. The introduction of non-native species to new areas, also called invasive species, also causes biodiversity loss. Some of them are accidental, like the zebra mussels, exotic pets, and weeds. And some are intentional, such as when we plant food crops, when we bring in exotic pets, and plant certain plants. The invaders, or the, the invasive species, have no predators in the area, or no parasites or competitors. So they increase in number, often uncontrollably, and displace native species. In the chart, here's a list of some invasive species. Around here, in southern Minnesota, you might recognize the European starling. And there's been talk lately of the emerald ash borer destroying ash trees in Minnesota. Human manipulation of Earth's climate has global impacts on the biodiversity as well. The emission of greenhouse gases warms temperature and modifies global climate patterns. And it increases the frequency of extreme weather events. This can have an impact on biodiversity. Increased stress forces organisms to shift their geographic ranges, and many species are not able to adapt. A temperature increase of 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius threatens 20 to 30 percent of species with extinction. A mix of causes threaten many species. For instance, the monarch butterfly populations are declining. Industrial agriculture has eliminated most of the milkweed plants that monarchs depend on. They lay their eggs on the milkweed and their caterpillars feed on it. Pesticides intended for crop pests also kill monarchs. And in Mexico, the forests where they migrate to are being illegally logged. Often reasons for declines can be complex and difficult to determine. The worldwide collapse of amphibians provides an apparent example of a perfect storm of bewildering factors. Today, entire populations of frogs, toads, and salamanders are vanishing without a trace. Over 40% of the 7,200 known species of amphibians are in decline. 30% are threatened, and at least 170 species studied just years or decades ago are thought to be extinct. As these creatures disappear before our eyes, scientists are racing to discover the reasons and studies in implicate a wide array of factors. Today, more and more scientists and citizens perceive a need to stop the loss of biodiversity. Conservation biology is the area of science devoted to understanding factors, forces, and processes that influence the loss, protection, and restoration of biological diversity. It's an applied and goal-oriented science. It has implicit values and ethical standards. Researchers integrate evolution and ecology as they use field and lab data, theory, and experiments to study our impacts on organisms. At the genetic level, conservation geneticists ask how small a population can become and how much genetic variation it can lose before running into problems such as inbreeding depression. By determining a minimum viable population size, conservation geneticists help wildlife managers decide how vital it may be to increase a population. Scientists study species dispersal and gene flow to determine how likely that a population will persist when faced with habitat change and other threats. Endangered species are a focus of conservation efforts. The primary legislation for protecting biodiversity in the United States is the Endangered Species Act 
of 1973. It offers protections to species that are endangered or in danger of extinction or threaten, meaning they're likely to become endangered in the near future. It forbids the government and citizens from taking actions that destroy endangered or threatened species as well as their habitat. It forbids trading in products made from these species and its aim is to prevent extinction, to stabilize declining populations and enable populations to recover. In 2014, recovery plans were in place for 75% of the 1,189 endangered and 328 threatened species in the U.S. Intensive management has saved or stabilized species. 40% of declining populations have been stabilized, such as the bald eagle, the peregrine falcon, and brown pelican, have been removed from the endangered list. That would be termed a success. Recurrent successes have occurred despite problems though. Underfunding of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fishery Service is an example. And recent political forces have tried to weaken the ESA. The greater sage grouch, which is pictured here, is a species whose addition to the endangered species list is warranted by science, but yet receives a lack of funding. Polls repeatedly show that most Americans support protecting endangered species, yet some opponents feel that the ESA imperils people's livelihoods and that it's controversial. This has been a common perception in the Pacific Northwest where protection for the northern spotted owl and the marbled marillet birds that rely on old growth forests have slowed timber harvesting, causing loggers to fear for their jobs. In addition, many landowners worry that federal officials will restrict the use of private land on which threatened or endangered species are found, which has led to a practice described as shoot, shovel, and shut up among landowners who want to conceal the presence of species on their land, meaning that they kill the endangered species and bury it and then don't talk about it. In fact, however, the ESA has stopped very few development projects and a number of its provisions and amendments promote cooperation with landowners. Habitat conservation plans and safe harbor agreements are arrangements that allow landowners to harm species in some ways if they improve habitat for them in others. Today many nations have laws protecting species, although they are not always effective. When Canada enacted its Species at Risk Act in 2002, the Canadian government was careful to stress cooperation with landowners and provincial governments and not to present the law as a decree from the national government. Environmental advocates and scientists protested that the law was weak and failed to protect habitat adequately. The United Nations has facilitated several international treaties to protect biodiversity. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna in Florida, or CITES, was enacted in 1973. It protects endangered species by banning international transport of their body parts. The Convention on Biological Diversity was held in 1992. It seeks to conserve biodiversity, to use biodiversity in a sustainable manner, to ensure the fair distribution of biodiversity's benefits, and its goal is to achieve by 2010 a significant reduction of the current rate of biodiversity loss. This goal was not met. Captive breeding, reintroduction, and cloning are also being pursued as solutions to help the problem. In captive breeding, individuals are bred and raised so that they can be reintroduced into the wild. Reintroductions can be resource intensive but can pay big dividends. For example, black rhinos 
translocated from South Africa to Serengeti National Park. And captive breeding and reintroduction has helped the California condor. In cloning, DNA from an endangered species is inserted into an egg without a nucleus. And then the egg is inserted into a closely related species to develop the pregnancy and bring the fetus to term. Several mammal species have been cloned, but these efforts are not enough to recreate lost biodiversity. Without ample habitat and protection in the wild, having cloned animals in zoos does little good. Forensics can help protect species. Forensic science analyzes evidence to identify or answer questions relating to crimes. Conservation scientists use forensics to protect species at risk from illegal harvesting. DNA identifies a species and its geographic origin, and detecting illegal activity helps enforce laws and protect wildlife. For instance, DNA from killed elephants shows many more were killed than the Zambian government realized. To prioritize regions for conservation, scientists have mapped biodiversity hotspots. A biodiversity hotspot is a region that supports an especially great number of species that are endemic, or meaning they are found nowhere else in the world. To qualify as a hotspot, though, a region must harbor at least 1,500 endemic plant species. It must have lost 70% of its habitat as a result of humans' impact. Focusing on hotspots protects the greatest number of species per unit effort. 2.3% of the land surface contains 50% of all plant species and 42% of all terrestrial vertebrate species. On the map below, we can see the world's biodiversity hotspots highlighted. Parks and protected areas act to conserve biodiversity at the ecosystem level. Preserving land in parks and protected areas conserves habitats, communities, ecosystems, and landscapes. 13% of the world's area is in parks, wilderness, reserves, etc. But not all of these areas are managed for biodiversity. Some are used for recreation and water protection, and they're also illegally logged and poached or have their resources extracted. Some are large enough to preserve whole systems. Linking protected areas allows populations to intermix, which can be good for biodiversity. Community-based conservation is growing. In the past, conservationists from industrialized nations in their zeal and zest to preserve ecosystems in developing nations often neglected the needs of the people in the areas that they wanted to protect. Developing nations came to view this as a kind of neo-colonialism. Today, in contrast, many conservation biologists actively engage local people in efforts to protect land and wildlife, a cooperative approach called community-based conservation. It offers education, health care, and development aid, and people are retrained to protect species. Local resources can be sustainably managed. For instance, in East Africa, conservationists and scientists began working with the Maasai and other people in the region years ago, understanding that to conserve animals and ecosystems, Local people need to be the stewards of the land and feel invested in conservation. And this has proven challenging because parks and reserves were created on land historically used by local people. In conclusion, biodiversity is being lost rapidly and visibly, threatening mass extinction. Primary causes of biodiversity loss are habitat alteration, pollution, Overharvesting, invasive species, and climate change. Humans cannot function without biodiversity's benefits. Conservation biologists today are conducting research to, to guide our efforts. 
to help and to help save endangered species and protect their habitats, restore populations, and preserve and restore natural ecosystems. 